Steel Internet, Matt here for the Dork Lords. And today I'll be talking about Westworld Season 4, Episode 2, Well Enough Alone. Now, you might be wondering, where's Paul? Good question. We recorded our recap, and then I realized afterwards that my audio was missing. That's on me. So, in the interest of time, I'm recording this solo. However, I will include clips of Paul's side of the conversation, uh, because his audio was fine. Paul wins. We open with the host, Clementine, being killed by host William after refusing to give up Maeve's whereabouts. We see a version of her later in the episode under William and Charloris's control. We end with Maeve and Caleb entering the newest Delos Park, Chicago World. It's currently unnamed, but it's definitely an homage to Chicago in the Roaring Twenties. The town is named Temperance, but the train they're on says it runs from Atlanta to Chicago. Which means that as Chicagoans, Paul and I are living in a theme park. Thought I was paying rent, but apparently I've just been paying my Delos admission fee. And as it turns out, I also spent several years living in Atlanta, so basically uh, I am in this show. Quick side note, Paul attended my wedding, which was at the Blackstone Hotel here in Chicago, which in the 20s is where Al Capone got his hair cut. And the crystal ballroom where the reception took place can be seen in the film Untouchables. There's a famous scene in which Al Capone bashes in the head of one of his henchmen with a baseball bat. So that was where, that was where my wedding happened. Or was it a storyline in the park? I mean, we are technically living in the 20s, just not quite so roaring. Second side note, eagle-eyed commenter Napdragon noted that Paul occasionally records from the room I record in, and Napdragon suggested we might have a clubhouse, which <laughs> I love that idea. It's actually just my office, and Paul records there when I'm working from home. But henceforth, that room shall be known as the Dork Lord's Clubhouse. Anyway, Paul, recording from the clubhouse, what did you think of episode two? I was, uh, did not enjoy it. I did not think it was a very good episode. Um, and, you know, it's not giving me a lot of uh, um, confidence in uh, how they're going to uh, complete the season. Is it this one or is it next one? Are they even talked about the final season? If it goes on for much longer, though, they might have to do it without me. I thought it was stupid that the way that they brought uh, William back. Um, you know, it's like, it looked like they killed him. And so it's like, oh, he even asked at one point, why, why am I still alive? And that's what I'm asking. Why is he still alive? Oh, because we like to torture you, basically. It seems like it's the answer to me. It's like, so I didn't like that. But there's so much more. One thing that's sort of a mystery, and I think they should answer, and they haven't, is uh, all these, um, you know, robots that are walking around, uh, do they have their own conscience, or are they just different versions of Dolores, or or what? You know, I think they, weren't they saying that the uh, database that has everybody's personalities is lost or something? Um, I, and, and that's like the database that's like all the people who were like, oh, I want to put my brain into this thing so I can be rebooted, the humans who are there. But then all the uh, characters who were in Westworld in the park there had a different database, as I recall. Um, so it's my uh, it's my feeling that th every uh, robot that we're seeing is not some human that's been convinced to work on behalf of the other robots. That they're just robot personalities, and they're not giving me any reason to believe that it's not just a different version of Dolores. What I've come to decide is my main problem with the thing they did last year, where last season, where it's like, okay, um, who's in these? Uh, different robots there. Is it, ooh, is it Teddy? Is it, it turns out, no, it's just Dolores split into four or five or how many there were. And so that reduced the dramatic uh, importance of that because it's like, you know, oh, the one that sacrifices the, uh, herself, oh, okay, she's the one who's having feelings. But the other ones, no, they're just perfectly happy to be doing evil stuff. And they're evil, doing evil in other people's bodies. So it's like, oh, well, what's their personality? I don't know who they're about, or what, oh, it doesn't matter. They're just there to kill all the humans. Who cares? So Paul is obviously not thrilled with episode two. <laughs> 
And one of the major problems he cites is that with the ambiguity of the personalities inside the hosts, it's hard to care about them, uh, with the possible exception of Maeve. A problem I note is that the dialogue feels stilted. It's people having conversations, but they don't feel conversational. It doesn't sound like conversations people would actually have. And Charloris is weighing on me a bit, kind of like uh, King Joffrey did, like back in the Game of Thrones. We get it. He, he was evil. Does every word coming out of his mouth have to be evil? Would you like a muffin, sire? Yes, but only if it's an evil muffin. Like, oh, just eat the breakfast. Can we have someone just not be evil for two minutes? And that, that applies to Charloris. She's like in an evil loop, you know, her evil host loop. We get it. You got plans, and they're evil. Let's move on. Okay, I've got a theory about Christina, that storyline, a.k.a. Dolores Proxy. In season three, the whole reason Serac plugged Dolores into Rehoboam was to search her mind for the key to the sublime. But she didn't have it. She gave that information to Bernard, who used it to enter the sublime uh, for several years. In fact, he might still be there at the time of this season. Remember in episode one, when host William is talking about the data stored in the Hoover Dam? He says it's encrypted. He can't access it. Charlores and her lackeys, I think, are trying to reopen the door to the sublime, but they still don't have the key. So, they've uploaded what they've got of Dolores' consciousness into a simulation, and they're trying to push her into giving up information about the key. For instance, she's at a mental facility in this episode, and in one of the rooms you see a drawing of the tower on the wall. In a trailer, we've seen Bernard standing in front of that drawing, and the fact that she can make her thoughts reality tells me that they want her to eventually imagine the key to the sublime and then perhaps make it real. Examples of Christina uh, imagining something and having it come to reality. There's that moment when there's a bunch of folks in hard hats in the mental facility, and she says, I just wish they'd leave, and then they leave. Uh, there's the moment where the crazy guy's talking about how, oh, can you hear the sound of the tower? And only I can hear them and the birds. Uh, and as soon as he says that, and then she continues to walk, she starts noticing dead birds, as though when she thought of it, it happened. Um, also, of course, there's the, the whole subplot with this guy Myers, and she realizes that his story is a storyline that she created almost verbatim, and that's why she goes to the mental facility and starts realizing, wait, but he died earlier, but why is this a thing? So that's why I think maybe this is a storyline that was placed into the simulation that she is now in. They're just trying to give her stimulation within the simulation to encourage her to reproduce the key to the sublime. That's, that's what I think is happening. So one of the big questions I have is why do the hosts want to reopen this park, <laughs> right? I mean, so that's, that seems to be the thing is the man in black and Charloris, they go around, they, uh, they take over the vice president, they take over the uh, senator, uh, because those people would have voted against a uh, park reopening, as you would, as any sane person would, because of the terrible events that had happened years earlier. Um, so, in some ways, that makes sense that they they've created a, enough hosts that they can, uh, you know, control the rules. Apparently, there's there's that moment where one of the hosts says, "There are 249 of us at the moment." So, okay, so they've done it. We I get the how, but there's the why. You know, first, like, why are they doing it? Why do they want to attract people to this park? Um, I think maybe the best reason would be, maybe it's like a way to bring the elites to them that they can then pick and choose because they have, you know, they like, give us your personal data and then boop, 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 and then they can kind of figure out, oh, this person, we'd like to create a host of this person. So they basically, while they're in the park, maybe give them the nanobot flies, which, we talked about, we theorized that that was going to be used to control humans. I think that's pretty much proved out in episode two. Um, and so maybe that's a, it's just an easy way. They come to you, you take control of them, and when they leave the park, they're pretty much already under your control. That's maybe my best thought for how that, the reasoning behind it. But that said, if you're a person 
uh, out there in the world. And somebody's like, we got a grand opening of this park where we <laughs> had this violent, fatal disaster years earlier. Do you want to be the first to join in the new park? Hell no! I mean, at least wait a few months for like a Yelp review, maybe, or something. No, but yeah, like, no. I want to be the first person to return to this park where everyone was killed on sight. That's some some brave slash stupid folks. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, there are a lot of dumb people in the world. Come on. How dare you have faith in humanity, sir? <laughs> I like the choice of the Roaring Twenties for the latest park. Mainly because the Roaring Twenties were followed by the Great Depression. And I think the implication is that the real world in the Westworld universe is about to undergo a similar decline. Charloris gives us a little glimpse into the plan. She said that it's impractical to kill everyone. Uh, that that's not their plan. Uh, of course, they've already got the vice president and the senator, as I mentioned. This is definitely a future world style plot, where in that storyline, they just basically took over important people and then ran things. Keeping William alive in this Vitruvian man machine is probably not simply to torture him. I'm guessing maybe they're keeping him alive to make copies of him in case Fidelity breaks down. I think Fidelity could theoretically still be an issue, unless they've solved it in between seasons. So maybe that's why they're keeping him alive. I think that question is still out there to be answered. Why is William, human William, still alive? Final question I've got is, what happened after the lighthouse? We get this almost throwaway bit of dialogue where Caleb talks to Maeve and he's like, you know, are we ever going to talk about this? So remember there was a flashback in episode one where it's Maeve looking over a seemingly mortally wounded Caleb. He's bleeding out uh, on the ground. I think that is whatever this lighthouse thing was. It was some kind of a mission they ran. It was probably successful, but in the aftermath, Caleb got shot up pretty bad. And then he's asking, like, hey, we're going to talk about the after effects. I mean, on a surface, if this wasn't a Westworld show, if it was just like a drama, I'd be like, did they have sex? Because that's because he, he brings up his wife right after, like, well, I'm going to talk about it with my wife or whatever. Um, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's what's happened here, but uh, you know, may, I don't know. I don't know. We saw Caleb bleeding out. I guess we're, the question is, you know, did Maeve do something unethical or just out of bounds to save his life? Did she turn him into a host somehow? I'm not sure. Yeah, anyway, I think, I think that is uh, going to be answered at some point in this season. They're gonna have a flashback to something revelatory that happened between Caleb and Maeve after this mission to the lighthouse. Anyway, so um, we're going to keep at this. Paul, we're going to cross our fingers that episode three uh, get you back on board. So come on back. We'll be talking about episode three, and we'll also be talking about the season finale of Strange New Worlds. <laughs> Paul, uh, back at the clubhouse. Hope everything's going all right, uh, and we'll talk to everybody next time. Bye.